That's also in the Rufus Shalem of George, Joshua, Ben Mordechai? Yosef. Yosef Ben Mordechai. Okay, also today's sponsors are Jay Goldman and the owner Hatzacha for Parnas and Zivug, Shnur Zalman Peretz Ben Sipora, and for the Rufus Shalem, Menachem Mendel Betzar Bacha Ben Devor Fege. Amen. Amen. We will have a full shalema. Okay. We have a big, big, big topic today. Today we're going to talk about fighting depression and turning it into joy. Okay? Welcome to America. <laughs> Welcome to America. We know 25% of women over 40 are taking, are taking antidepressant medication today. We know, and those are the people who have insurance. Imagine the ones that don't have insurance. We have a major... We have a major soul problem nowadays. There's a soul. There's a, the soul is starving. Could we just? Could we just the, the? Could we just the water, please? Okay. So again, the bottom line of today's class is: if you can take it, you can make it. So we're going to talk about all kinds of things that are putting us in slavery. Rabbi Nachman said something very, very, very bold. He says the key: a person cannot get closer to God unless he has a settled mind. Number one. I don't care what religion you're in. If you don't have a settled mind, it will, it's going to be literally impossible to get closer to God. Whether you're religious, whether you're Chabad, whatever you are. Settle, get, being settled mind is the number one thing. And nowadays, that's the biggest problem. Nobody has a settled mind. So that's why I put so much energy into first fixing the mind. You know, the Yet Sahara, as long as he puts a thought into your head, he can paralyze your whole body. He doesn't need to get you by the legs. He puts a, he puts a thought in your head, that's it, you're paralyzed. You can't move. You can see people nowadays, they're just, they're paralyzed. I meet a lot of people, especially, I work in the addiction industry, and I'm seeing common trends, common trends that literally people, they have a couple of situations in their life and knock, they knock, get knocked out. You know, at the end of the day, I gave this great example in the rehab, and I asked them, hey guys, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? So one guy says, 28 days. How bad, how bad was that movie? How bad was that movie? I said, imagine walking to that movie every single day of your life. That's exactly what's happening. People are walking into the same movie. Meanwhile, they have options to go to other movies, but they're walking into the same movie every single day of their lives. And that's a choice. So that's why we really have to fight it. We know that in order for, to, for a person to have prophecy, one indication to have prophecy is joy. That means if a person wants to have any kind of prophecy, for example, some people are making the biggest decisions of their life when they're depressed. So you know it's not coming from a good place. You understand? The biggest decisions that I know people are making today, it, they're making it in a very bad state. They're making it when they're depressed. And that's a very scary predicament because at the end of the day, you're not getting the, an, you're not getting the answer from God. The only way you make a decision is when a person's happy. So this is not a joke. This is not, oh, it's nice to be happy. It's a good thing to be happy. Rabbi Nachman says, first be happy and then be religious. <laughs> uh-huh. First be happy and then you can be religious. It's the first thing. Because you can't be religious if you're not happy, because you missed the whole boat. Rabbi Brody said, very simple, Rabbi Rush said, for a person who's religious and he walks around depressed, it's a Hilu Hashem, because you're showing that Judaism is, is a depressed religion. What, what is this? That's why people are disconnecting. They're disconnecting because they see, look at this guy. Is this, guy, is this who I want to be? So they're disconnecting very quickly to people. So happiness, from Nachman said, is a must. And not only do you have to be happy, but you have to fight. You have to fight for it. Your brain generally wants to show you what's wrong with your life, not what's, not what's good with your life. So this is something that we have to really, really fight, and that's why I spend so much, so much energy. Rav Nachman says here in Lesson 10, very simple. He says, if a person, God forbid, the sole reason why people are distant from God and they do not draw closer to Him is because they don't have a settled mind. And this includes why? Because the depression makes it impossible to direct your mind. That's the first thing you need to get out of this class. As long as I'm not in a state of, of, of settled mind, there's no way I can come closer to God. Understand this very clearly. Understand this very clearly. You have to understand. If I don't settle my mind, if I don't, I'm not careful what I focus on every day, this is going to be the result. Because remember, if you, depression at the end of the day, people don't sin when they're happy. I never heard a guy in rehab say, you know what, I got, how'd you get here? Oh, I was too happy. I, I was just so happy, I just ended up here, I took the wrong turn. I I'm, I'm, have so much happiness, I needed to take a drug. Drug only comes because it's, it's, you're connecting to the other side. We're going to talk about today also the three things that, are, that are, we are a slave to. Remember, you can't, be, you can't be free and be a slave. 
can't, it can't happen. So there's three factors today that we're going to talk about later in the class that you, are, you become an evit to, you become a slave to it. So it's not like, you know what, I can look at, and, and look at God's names, Yudke, Vavke, and, and, and that's how I'm going to get closer to God. No, you need to eliminate a lot of garbage that's stopping light from coming. Light always coming to a person. It doesn't have to be, you have to be religious, you have to be standing in a mountain in spot. No, a person could get very, very high levels today. But he has to be able to eliminate what's causing him. So for example, if you're, if you're focused 90% on your pleasures in life and 10% on your soul, then you, that's the imbalance you're going to have. You understand? Soul searching is something, you need oxygen. Your soul needs oxygen. If your soul doesn't have oxygen, it's going to be, you're, coming, you're going to be depressed. You can only be happy in your soul state. You can't be happy in your ego state. Because if in your ego state, you're always going to be chasing, chasing something to make you happy. And you're always going to need somebody to validate you. People that have a high ego always need validation from people all the time. Look, he wasn't nice to me. This person didn't say nice to me. Or, or, or another guy, when I get this job, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. You always need something. It's a showing, it's basically, the, it's a sign of discontent. The Gemara says something very beautiful. He says something very beautiful, Gemara. The Lush says, we are, we are commanded, when a person eats food, he's commanded to leave a piece of bread on his table. Right? Why? And he says, a person who does not leave bread on his table, at the end of his meal, will never have a sign of blessing. But I, I, have a, I have some food, and all of a sudden I eat it, and next thing you know I'm going to be broke. What, 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 what's, what's the real significance of that? Why do I have to leave a sign of blessing? So one opinion says, because you have to be able to give charity to somebody else. And the second opinion, which is, I, I heard this, I flipped down. Because what happens is when you, when you eat, and you don't leave something on the table, you're basically telling God, hey God, you didn't give me enough food. You didn't give me enough food. But when you leave a piece on the table, you're basically saying, I have enough. I have enough. I'm content. So that person will have blessing in his life because he's content. The person who's always eating and always needs more and more and more will never have contentment. So that's why being, God forbid, a person being in gluttony, it's a spiritual sign that he's away from the truth and it's a spiritual sign that, that, that he's going to be depressed. So it's not, it's not just, it's, it's a whole, whole factor. So even the way you eat is an indication how you serve God. It's not just whether you pray, it's eating, it's everything. It's, it's the, the mundane things. So, leaving a piece on the table is telling God, God, I have enough. You gave me more than enough. You're basically showing contentment. Another guy, give me more food. Give me more. It's always about more. Your ego wants more. Your soul wants, is happy with what it has. Your soul is happy with gratitude. Your ego always wants more. So, we're gonna, again, we're going to talk about the three major things that are causing this. Okay? So again, depression is not something, you don't catch a depression. You create one. You catch a cold. How do you, how do you, catch, how do you catch a depression? You have to do a lot of things to get, to the, to get depressed. You can't just catch it. First, you have to, number one thing is you have to focus on what's wrong with your life. First thing you have to do. What's missing in my life? That's the first thing. Second is your, your body. When a person is depressed, what does he do? He slumps his shoulders. He talks in a soft voice. You know, if people call me, listen, I have this problem. They say, hello. Like, hello, wake up. Why are you talking like this? Why are you talking like this? I can't say, hello. Well, like, what happened? You see people just like the, the whole, your physiology. You know what I'm saying? People just changing your physiology is so huge. Just simple physiology can make a difference. If you stand up, you're looking up, you can't be depressed. But if you're looking down and you're focusing on what's wrong and you can't breathe, you're going, to be, you're going to feel, you're telling your body, by the way, I'm depressed. So if, if a person changes his physiology, this is just simplicity. Be, let's not talk about how we got to the pit. Let's not talk about who, who threw us in the pit and, and, and the midlife crisis that we have. Let's just talk about, I like to talk about, let's just talk about one minute about simple physiology. How just changing the way you, you, you talk, changing the way you, you sit, and the way you, your posture can change the way you think. You probably never heard a class about simple physiology. But I walk around, you go to rehab, those guys, they're sitting like this, they're walking, you know, nobody's standing like this, ready to be. They're all sitting like, like life is over, doomsday scenario. <laughs> and, and, and what do you, what, what kind of message, even if I tell you everything in the world, what are you actually going to hear if you're sitting around like this? If you're walking around like this, how could you possibly have oxygen to make the right decision? So our physiology, how we physically hold ourselves, it actually affects your nervous system. Basically, our physiology 
It, li- it, communicates your, to your, it communicates with your brain to inform it that basically you're in a depressed state. And that begins already creating certain chemicals to get you in that mood. So when you walk around and you have a very low voice, life is over, you're actually sending a signal to yourself. That's what Rabbi Nachman used to say. Scream! Scream that I have a muna! One of the things Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 54, you can't just say I have a muna. You have to scream, I believe in Hashem. You have to feel it. One, of the good, one, one way to, to know 100% that you're not in your soul state, remember, happiness only comes in your soul state. It doesn't come in, your, in any other state. You can't be happy just, just on, on lust. It's temporary. You, you might sound like it's happy, but it's temporary. So one indication that a person is connected to God is how he prays. If he can feel the words on his prayers, if he can feel the words, if he can feel what he's saying, that's an indication you're connected to your soul. If you're praying and you don't feel anything, you're completely, completely disconnected to your, to your soul. So that's why you don't feel like praying. People don't want to feel, they don't feel like praying because the experience is they're not feeling it. Or they're distracted by, by things in life. So again, your physiology, your language. Well, how, how do you talk? Hello? You know, good morning. Good morning. What are you thinking to say good morning like that? Like, how do you come into an office saying good morning with that? Just simple talking louder. Like when, I, when people call me. This, I have a problem. Okay, I, I, I can't hear you. Can you speak up? So people don't realize when you, when you think with so much toxic, you start talking like that. And then you start acting like a victim. And then you eventually become the vic- a victim, God forbid. Your mental focus. What are you focusing on on 90% of the day? So these are just, these, just, these are simple things that you, the way you walk, the way you stand has an effect on, on your chemical, your sending signals to your brain on exactly how you feel, how, the way you talk, and the way you're thinking of, you're actually sending signals to your body. You're basically, your body's asking you, it's showing you evidence that you're depressed. And then you, people will ask stupid questions and then they'll get stupid answers. How worse is my day gonna get? You're gonna get a stupid answer. Here, let me show you how bad your day's gonna get. You're gonna get a flat tire. So when you're, when you're in these kind of states, you start asking stupid questions. When, when is this thing gonna be over? One thing about depressed people, and again, I'm not here to make fun of, fun of people. Um, I believe some, some are people are born with heavy, you know, they're more depressed than other people. They're born with some chemical balance, postpartum depression. But generally, just because the doctor t- gives you a title, doesn't mean you're depressed. Doesn't mean your life should be over. I mean, I had a guy that was in the breast of center. I had a great example. And he tells me, I said, well, well, why are you sitting like, you, 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 why are you sleeping? Why are you sitting like that? He says, my doctor told me I'm clinically depressed. Okay, so what does that mean? What do we do with this? What do we do? What, what are we supposed to do? We, we go to the... How, how, what, is, what does that mean? You take, he says, yeah, I, I can't be happy. My doctor told me I'm clinically depressed. So I said, here you go. I have a rehab. I'm going to give you a prescription. Now you're clinically happy. What are you going to do? <laughs> he didn't know what the guy didn't know what to do. He, he didn't know what to do. What do you mean I'm clinically happy? How can I be clinically... I said, he's a doctor. I'm giving you a prescription telling you you're clinically happy. The guy was so confused that he didn't even know what to do. He's like, just like that, I can, you could say you're clinically happy? Yeah, somebody's opinion of you doesn't mean that's you. And sometimes you go to a doctor, the guy tells me, oh, you're, gonna, you, you, you're depressed, you're clinically depressed, and that's, that's your story in life. And then what happens? You, become a, you, you start taking pills all day long in your life, and you don't seek any, and then, and then you never get, you never think there's, there, you have a fixed mindset, and you say, basically, I was born this way. Very scary concept. There's no such thing as despair. Either you have a, that's why you have to be careful not to have a fixed mindset. Carol Dweck has a book called Mindset. You can either have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. A fixed mindset says, this is the way my life is. That's not true. It's not true. That's a story. You're saying that because that's what you believe. You're telling yourself all that, but that's what you, it's not true. A person's a soul. You're not born with a depressed soul. I tell people in rehab, you are not born with an alcoholic soul. What happens? You have a lot of layers on your soul and that you're creating a lot of darkness and you're not seeing any light. So let's work on the darkness. Let's, re- let's work on removing the layers. It's not that like you're not born with a, a depressed soul. What kind of ridiculous thing is this? So people think, oh, it's my mazal, it's this, it's my mezuzah. Who's somebody threw me into a pit? And okay, so the problem is people are going to complain to you all day long on somebody threw them into the pit. We all get thrown into a pit. Even Yosef Atzali got thrown into a pit. We all get thrown into a pit at one point of our lives. I got thrown into a pit. The difference is, what happens? You can either stay in the pit, or you can, or I ask, okay, don't you want to get out of the pit? The guy says, well, 
What are people going to think of me? I have mud on my shoes. So you're worried about what people think of you, but you'd rather stay in the pit? You understand? Get out of the pit! You have an option to get out of the pit. Every, day, every single day is, is, is a renewal. That's what we spoke about. You have to believe that every single day is a brand new day. So you can't have a fixed mindset. You have to have a growth mindset. Don't say, it's never going to work out. This is nonsense. This is not what the Torah is telling you. If you guys understood where we come from, where do we come from? We come from, Mashiach is going to come from Davir Melech. What did Davir Melech do? What did, how did Davir Melech come out? Manoach, Boaz had 60 children. He didn't invite Manoach to his wedding because he said, you know, why am I going to invite Manoach to, to a wedding? At the end of the day, he has no children. I don't want to make him feel bad. So what happened? Hashem caused 60 of his children to die. And then his wife died. So you say, this guy, he lost 60 children. His wife died. That's it. Life is over. You know what he did? He says, I'm not giving up. He remarried. He got remarried to Ruth. And from Ruth comes Ovid, and that's where David and Melch, and that's where the Mashiach is coming from. From a guy who lost 60 children, and his wife, and was able to have the courage to get up and say, you know what, my life isn't over. That's why when, when, when people are sick, God forbid, what do we do? We read to Hillam. You're, you're connecting to the power of, of, a, of a comeback. You understand? You have to believe every single day is a comeback in your life. Rabbi Nachman's message is, if you can destroy, you can rebuild. If you can destroy, you can rebuild. There's no such thing as giving up. That's why we really, the number one thing we really have to pray for, Hashem, give me a new mind frame. Don't pray for situations to change. Don't pray for things to get better. Pray that you should have a different perception on life. You have a perception problem. You're not viewing life the right way. That's what I try to tell people. You, the way you're looking at life, you're not looking at life the right way. You focus on what's wrong with your life instead of how blessed you are. And that, unfortunately, brings you a lot of dinim. So the number one thing you should pray for in life is one thing. Is what? I need a new mind frame. <laughs> Forget the situation, because I can have situations. If I have the same mind frame, I have a problem. So you have to pray for a new perspective on life. How to view life differently. But when you start changing the way you look, you look at life, then Hashem changes the way He looks at you. Very simple. If you're looking at life like it's empty, then upstairs they're going to show you the same thing. That's why you are a co-creator. If you understood you are a co-creator, it's a very powerful thing. Because if, if down here, if, if they're singing the blues down here, upstairs they have to show. Listen, we can't sing a different tune. The guys at 101.5, we got to be on 101.5 upstairs. You can't be on 96.5, 101.5 here. It doesn't work. So you are, you are in control of your destiny. It's a very, if you, if you understand that, then you're very careful on what you focus on, you're very careful on what you're doing, you're very careful on how you interpret things in life. You're very careful. Why would you interpret something that you don't, that, that you don't want to interpret that way? Because upstairs they're going to do the same thing to you. So that's why I told people, unless you change your mind frame, I can't help you. If you look at life differently, if you have an open mind frame, then life changes for you. Bottom line. Bottom line. So there's a great story, a great, great article I read the other day. And he says, imagine if a person is reading a book about his life. He's the main character. Who's the main character? So you're reading a book about, about a book, and all of a sudden, first couple of chapters, okay, the guy has rough times. Second chapter, okay. Third chapter, you know, you're waiting. Fourth, fifth chapter, you're waiting for the comeback. You know, you're waiting for the guy to get his act together. You know, you read a book. Who writes a book about, you know, a horror film, you know? Okay, fifth chapter. When's the comeback happening? What chapter is the comeback happening? You can either write two stories. You can write a victim story about your life, or you can write a hero story about your life. You have to decide what chapter you're going to make the comeback on. <laughs> write the same, right? You should, a person should do, do this exercise. Here's my life, and here's my life. Here's the victim side of my life, and here's the hero side of my life. What would you think about the main character of the movie if this guy all day long, he threw in the towel for everything? What would you say? What kind of, movie, what kind of book is this? What, what would you think about the main character in the movie? What would you, what would you think about him? What's wrong with this guy? When, when's, the, when's the comeback happening? <laughs> when are you making the comeback? That's exactly. It sounds so simple, but that's exactly true. You have the ability at any time to make that comeback. And you have to realize that's your life. You can change your life in one minute from a victim to a hero. I know it took me a year and a half to do that in my situation. I was a victim for a long time. And then I said, you know what? This victim stuff, it's not too much fun. You know what? Let me change it. Let me change the way I look at things. 
And then I became the hero to the story. So if you look, if you're reading the same book, when do you, when, what, what chapter is the comeback on? Chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 7, when's the comeback? Ask yourself, how long, how many chapters do you have to go through? Because the people are going to get tired of the book and say, listen, this guy's a, I don't want to read this book. You are the main character in the story, you are the author in the story, and you have the ability to change your destiny. <laughs> Very important concept. Very important concept. So ask yourself, how are you going to create that? How are you going to make that comeback? Very important. So remember, victim versus hero, when are you going to make the comeback? So I said, you know what? If you believe it, if a person has a muna, like we spoke about in last week's class, and you believe every single day has its new blessing, I could say right now I can make a comeback. If you don't have a muna, and if you don't have trust in God, life is over. You, then you write it down. Then you write, life is finished. And then what are you doing? You're chasing addictions. Usually an indication that a person doesn't have meaning in his life, he's going to, he's going to always chase society's candies versus his soul. People sell their soul all the time. They sell their soul. We're going to talk about the three factors that are causing this to happen. Okay? So remember, we've got to change the physiology. Physiology. How are you walking around? If, somebody, if you saw a movie about yourself, what is this guy? Why is he walking around like this? Why is he talking like, 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 so low? Record yourself one day. One day at the office. You're going to think, who's this guy? Who's this guy in the movie? Why is he doing that? If you were independent, you would say, what's this guy, do? what's this guy doing? How could he possibly succeed with the way he's dealing with life? So before we get into Kabbalistic problems and all this, let's just work on fundamentals. I think one of the things that is missing in, in, our, in, our, in Judaism is fundamentals. The fundamentals are so off. Just simple fundamentals. Eating the way you eat, the, per, the way a person walks, the per, way a person stays. Simple fundamentals are completely thrown out the window. It's like nobody had a class on these fundamentals. And everybody just copies everybody else. So I realized, why is this, you know, when you're about tshuva, you come with a new mind frame. You don't copy everybody else. You come with a very independent mind, and you're like, why is everybody walking around the synagogue with their head down and thinking life is over? Why are people, why are people praying like this? So you come with a different energy. You don't understand what's going on in life. So remember, you have to be able to be focused. If your mind is focused, then you can decide where you want to go. If your mind is not focused, you're not going to know where you're going to go. And then you're going to be a slave. A slave to a person's desires. Many times we get situations in our life, and I gave this example about the, uh, the famous boat example. You know, boats, when a person has a cruise, he has a boat, specifically, every single room in the boat has a specific compartment that when water comes in, God forbid there's a leak in one, in one, one boat, one room, what happens? There's technology to shut all the water down in that room so it doesn't go to the next room. Why? Why is that happening? Because one guy can have, a, have one problem, and next thing you know, he's in the Titanic. The whole boat sinks. This is what's happening today. A person has a problem, and next thing you know, it leads to other, other parts of his life, and next thing you know, the boat sinks. Because he didn't keep it there. So we have to, we have to view things, we can't view things worse than they are. This is the problem, don't make it worse than it is. Don't make it worse than it is. It's just one portion of your life. If money is money's a problem, just keep it at that. Why should it turn into your relationship? Why should it turn into your health? Why should it turn into other portions of your life? But Malcolm clearly says, in Lesson 24, he says very simple. He says the reason why people are, get sick. Why do people get sick? He says, the underlying reason why a person is because he fails to focus on the purpose of this world. What happens, he's always focused on, why do people get sick? Because all his life, what is he doing? He's chasing his, his desires, all day long about his desires. So his soul says, listen, I'm here to optimize. My soul is here to become the best version of me. I'm here to give. Remember, two, two, two ways a person can be happy in life is growing and giving. If you're not growing and giving, you're not going to be happy. It's almost impossible. The key to happiness in life, in any part of your life that you've had success, think about why. Because you were growing and you were giving. If there's no growth and, and there's no growth and a person's not giving, you were born to give. We are born to give. You're not here, it's not about you all the time. Your soul says we. Your ego says me. You are born to always give, 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 give. So he's saying here the reason why people get sick, God forbid, is because his, his soul gets so weakened by his body. You have to understand your body and your soul, you have to keep them at a, at a constant level. I'm not saying don't go to heat games. I'm not saying you can enjoy your life. I enjoy my life. But my soul is, is also getting fed. 
My balance is always there. But if you only have 99% your, your body, 1% your soul, then it's about time a person is going to be able to, to, to get shut down in his life. You have to have an even balance. Keep it 50 50. But if it's all, if a person is all day long about his pleasures, all food, sex, drugs, it's everything, there's no way you're going to be happy. So at the end of the day, people realize that they could, be, they could be billionaires and be depressed. How could you be a billionaire and be depressed? Because you're not fulfilled. Tony Robbins says success without fulfillment means nothing. <laughs> you can't, you're not fulfilled. So money is not going to make you happy. There, there was a ratio they did on, on millionaires, and they, they, they realized that 55% of them said that money does not create happiness. Money does not create happiness. So whatever people are chasing, you have to make sure you're chasing the right thing. I'm not telling you not to be successful. I believe it, but at the end of the day, it can't just be about that. It can't just be about that. So he's saying here, so what happens when a guy gets a little bitterness in life, and he gets hit with a little, God forbid, a little sickness, so all of a sudden his body's not getting anything anymore, his soul's finally getting a little bitterness, and his soul says, finally, I got a break. The guy, he can't eat now. He can't go on, on his pleasure. So his soul says, you know what? Maybe the guy can change himself. That's why sometimes when people have hard times in their life, they turn to spirituality. Because their soul says, you know what? What am I running for? If 80 to 90% of my life of doctor visits are all, are all due to stress relation, what, what am I doing at the end of the day? What are you running to? 80 to 90% of all sicknesses, God forbid, could be preventable. And they're all due to stress. So a lot of them is people think they're in control of money all the time. Or food. We know what food's doing to people. We're going to talk about the three, three things that Rav Nachman said, the three things that are keeping a person in slavery. So you can be as spiritual as you want, but if, you still have, if you're still a slave to a certain desire, that's going to prevent you from going to anywhere. You understand? It doesn't work just like, I wake up, I have an awakening, and I can have my desires, and just have this awakening. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So remember, a person has tons of light, but he's creating shadows every time he has his desires. So we work a lot on desires. We work on food. Let's talk about those three. So, Rav Nachman says here, he says something very beautiful. He says that a person, if a person cannot, I said this the other day, if a person cannot, cannot find happiness, Rav Nachman says, borrow it. You know, people say all the time, when did I, one day I know I'm going to laugh about this. One day I'll be, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I know I'm going to get out of the situation and I'm going to laugh about this. So I tell laugh now. Why are you waiting one day to laugh? Laugh now. Borrow the happiness. Borrow the happiness. You're allowed to borrow happiness. Pretend, fake it till you make it. Sometimes you might have to fake it till you make it. Sometimes you have to sell yourself that you're going to be out. That's a muna. Sell yourself first and then the thing will come. So you see, Ibrahim Nachman says, you have to force yourself to be happy. He never said anything else about forcing, but he says one thing you have to force, because remember, all the sins, all of a person's sins, his worst decisions in his life, are coming from depression. And sometimes, God forbid, when you get depressed, it's very hard to get out. It's very hard to get out. Because you're going to think that, it's, you're going to think that life is over, and you're going to be paralyzed. So this is very important. But remember, we can't get out of a depression in our body state. We have to go in our soul state. Taking a pill, taking Prozac all day long, that's not going to get you out of depression. That's temporary. We know that. You can't paint a brown leaves green and think, okay, this is the solution. What's the root? What's the root of the problem? Why, the, why are the leaves turning brown? You want people paint them green. Oh, just, let's just paint them green. What's the root? The root is, the, the root is, there's a root problem. There's a fundamental problem and it's usually a muna. It's usually a muna. It's usually a lack of faith that's causing, unfortunately, the tree not to go to the right place. Okay, so let's talk about the desires a little bit. Okay, the three desires that Rav Nachman talks about. People are people in the sometimes people in the religious world are very uncomfortable talking about food. I don't know why, but it's a problem. You know, I always like to show, especially I, I meet a lot of people that are not that are not religious. I would say them. I would say maybe fifty or sixty percent of the people who listen to me are not are not religious you know, the 80% of the market. And I specifically want to get that heavy market because I want to show them that, by the way, whatever is scientifically proven nowadays, Rav Nachman has been saying this 250 years ago. So I like to go after that market because that, that market, I'm showing them like the power of now has been set 250 years ago. All the top-selling books on motivation, psychology, 
it's, the stories, these books have already been out a long time ago. I'm actually writing a book showing, we're actually going to show how the top, top 10, 15, 7 books, how we, Rav Nachman spoke about it 10, 15 years ago. So let's talk about the one, let's talk about the desires, okay? So what's the problem with desires? Okay? Rav Nachman says here, there are three traits that destroy the heart. We know if you don't have your heart into it, if a person doesn't have his heart into, it, into anything, if you don't have your heart in the relationship, the relationship's over. Right? If you don't have the heart, your heart in the relationship, there's no communication. If you don't have your heart in, in Judaism, you're not, you're not communicating. I guarantee you. That's why it's so hard nowadays for people to talk to God. Simple conversations, 10 minute conversations with God, you put people to do it, they, they, they don't know where to turn, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to start. I said, just talk to God, 10 minutes. The person who created you. They, they don't know where to turn to. They, how do I do it? What do I do? I can't do 10 minutes. Can I do 5 minutes? So, if you're asking those kind of questions, you gotta, you gotta say, hey, you can't do 10 minutes, you can't talk to God for 10 minutes? What are you doing all day? I mean, if you can't talk to God for 10 minutes and tell me you don't have time, you probably need around 2 hours to talk to God. <laughs> 10 minutes? I mean, you're that busy? What are you busy doing? So th- you have to stop sometimes. Stop and realize where you're going in life. So he's saying that there are three characteristics that undermine the fear. F- the connection is all in the heart. We know you, know, you know a person, oh, he's got a good heart. Oh, he has a cold heart. We, we, we define a person usually by his heart, right? His heart is, is an indication of who he is, right? And one thing for Shefa to come down, for a person to pray, one thing he has to do, you have to have Kavana. What is Kavana? Intention. How do you have Kavana? Right? Otherwise, I can pray like this. You see sometimes people praying, uh, Amen. No heart. Nobody can, this is reading, reading, reading about, uh, this is not a prayer. You see people pray like this. Amen. 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 That's how people pray. And then they, they check their phones while they do this. Sometimes they won't even do that. They, they'll even they check the phone, and this is the way they pro- approach God. Like this. So what happens? There's no heart. Because a person with heart would never pray like that. Correct? So what are the three things that are causing our heart to be slaves? We are commanded to get out of Egypt, not to, to be in Egypt. So he's saying here, the three traits are craving for wealth, craving for food, and craving for sexual pleasures. These three things undermine the heart. These are the three things if a person wants to get closer to God, work on these things first. Before you work on all your other problems, ask yourself, how is my, am I chasing money all day long? Am I eating, am I overeating? Is, is eating food making me sick? Do I have a problem? Am I always lusting? Do I have an addiction to, to, to sexual relations? Am I spilling the seed? These are the things that stop you from going to the next level. You can't just go to the next level and have spiritual with, with desires. Because the desires, anything in excess in life. We know we can eat something, and if we eat 75% of the meal, we feel good, we have energy, we want to do more things. After, if you eat 120% of the meal, that same meal could do what? Put you to sleep. Imagine, eating 25% more of the same food can either give you a tremendous energy, or an extra 25% more, you're sleeping. You're sleeping. Just by the same food. You would think, the more I eat, the more energy I have. Not, not true. Because what happens is, is a person gets a certain amount of food, so if he eats that certain food, he uses it to be able to use it for energy, to do whatever he has to do, he gets blessed. If a person uses the food to be able to, to as pleasure, then the food, what happens? It gains klipot. It gains things from the other side. Once things come to the other side, they attach on the person and they weigh him down. So now, nowadays, we know, if we understood, 60% of your ser- I'm sorry, 80% of your serotonin, what makes you happy, the, 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 the happy chemical in your brain is in your gut. You have more serotonin in your stomach than in your brain. How do you like that one? Scientifically proven. Google this. That means whatever you're eating, eating is, has, has a tremendous effect, even more sometimes than what you're thinking, on your, on your, on your brain. Just like that. Like, just like that. So why did Rav Nachman talk about the food so much? Listen to what he said. Rav Nachman says here, beautiful. He says, Our sages teach us that our stomach sleeps. It says what happens when a person, when the body 
is, is the guy's constantly eating and eating and eating. The stomach gets tired and says, listen, you just ate. Give me a break. I'm overworked. When the stomach gets overworked, that's when the guy gets tired. Too many, too, it's too much working. The stomach is, is not getting paid overtime. So when the stomach constantly eats, what happens? He's saying here, that person's main vitality lies in his intellect. One who's not using his intellect for full potential. That means if a person's not growing spiritually, if he's not growing in anything in his life, it's because he's in a state of constriction consciousness. He's in a state of, he stopped. Life stopped for him. What happens? He's saying many people seem to be alive. In fact, they're sleeping away their, 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 their lives away. And you know what he says? This, this sleep is caused by what? Improper eating or eating the wrong foods. So yes, your health and what you eat, he's telling you right here, can affect the way you think. Bottom line, you have to ask yourself, what are you eating? What are you eating? You can't be so religious and eat the way you eat sometimes. So they have, everybody blames it on Shabbat. Oh, Shabbat. <laughs> Shabbat one times a week, not six times a week. So and, and now, we, now we know that if 60% of your serotonin is determined by your, is, is determining what you're eating, is determined what you're thinking, hello, wake up. <laughs> what are you eating? What are you eating? He says, eating can cause confusion. Now we know why, how, how a person has a gut leak in the stomach can actually create what? ADD, ADHD, anxiety, <laughs> depression. Why? Because your stomach has a gut leak. If your stomach has a gut leak, then unfortunately the blood doesn't, is not able to properly circulate. So all of a sudden toxins come in, and next thing you know it affects the way you think. So eating can con cause confusion. It says that meeting after eating, a person often, often he's, he's going to be very confused. Why? Because what happens is the other side cut, the, cut part of the food. And he's saying, when a mind is developed, it's only... So he's saying here, a person can get his, his, his ability to think, his ability to make the right decisions, his ability to contemplate, is based on what he eats. And eating can put you to sleep. So it's not the joke where you can just be religious and eat what, the, what, what you want. Not true. Ram Nachman's telling you, he gave you five chapters, how a person's eating, the way he's eating, can put him into a depression. Look it up. There's tons of studies showing improper eating to depression. They say if you change your diet, you have a better chance of getting out of depression than Prozac. Why? Because you get natural serotonin in your stomach. Your stomach has 80% of the serotonin. What is a Prozac? Serotonin. So if you fix, if you get natural serotonin, what do you need the pill for? So, and also what happens? Stress. What does stress do? It destroys your stomach. First thing a guy stresses out, where is he going to feel it? Not in his pockets. He's going to feel it in his stomach. What happens when, when a person is stressed out? He, create, he releases cortisol. And what does the cortisol do, the fight or flight? It creates belly fat. It, it, it pretends like you're in a famine. Your body doesn't know if you're in, in Manhattan or if you're in Africa running from a tiger. If you get an email, you react the same way. Some people react the same way. So what happens? That creates adrenaline. And after the whole fight is over and you're exhausted after the day of work, what do you want to do? You want to eat because you're drained out. So people snack on food, sugar, they go up and down because a person's not eating properly, he's stressed out, up and down. So at the end of the day, at five o'clock after you come home from a roller coaster, of going up and down, yeah, you, you're probably not going to be wanting to do anything for your soul. You probably want to just check out. So this is, not, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. Diet is a real thing. Eating the proper foods is a real thing. And he says, yes, even kosher foods. He's saying, don't think it's just, oh, kosher, oh, you, oh, you, b'chal of Yisrael, etc., etc., but you have a gluttony problem. You're going to bar mitzvah and you're eating like this, oh, it's a, it's a meal, it's a, it's a mitzvah. No, no, no. In your brain, it's a mitzvah. But that's affecting people. That's affecting the people. You can't wake up in the morning. You can't wake up in the morning because you're not eating properly. You don't have energy. So think about it. Number one thing that's putting you in slavery and and, and it's clearly, scientifically showing the food's putting you into depression, and Rav Nachman's telling you spiritually it's putting you into depression. How can you fight that? So just by changing the way you eat, right away you can get out of the depression. You, you change the way you eat, and you exercise, forget all the psychological problems you have. Just those two things will help you think differently. Tal Ben Shahar says when a person doesn't exercise, it's like he's taking a depressant. You're not meant to sit, you're meant to move. You're meant to move. That's the purpose of life. You know, people are not meant to sit and, and look at phones all day long. You're meant to move, move. So a person has to realize. So that's the first one. Second one, 
He talks about wealth. When a person is constantly chasing money, we know that unfortunately, the Yetzirah knows how to get people. So what he's going to tell you, look what he says in Lesson 23. He says, people who are obsessed with the idea of getting rich lack faith in God's power because at the end of the day, God's the one that blesses you. You can do all the effort in the world. You can work 23 hours and still not be successful. Yet you can work five hours and have, be very successful. So unfortunately, people think they're in control of the money. So what do they do? They worry all day long. How am I going to make money? How am I going to pay for this? Every time you worry and you have anxiety, it's, it, it's making you more and more desperate. We spoke about it in the class of, our, of trust. When a person, how does a person bring Shefa to him? How does he bring abundance to him? By trusting in God. How do you chase away? How do you chase away? Worry. Think of the worst case scenario. Most, most couples nowadays, all day long I'm hearing this, they're fighting over money. What happens? They come home, the guy didn't make enough money, comes home, he screams at his wife. Next thing you know, you have dis- you have, you're disrespecting your wife, you're screaming at her. Next thing you know, what's the key to Parnas in the Jewish house? Making your wife happy. <laughs> so, you come home screaming, you're depressed, and then you want to sit there and expect blessing from God. Look what you're doing every day. Why? Because if a person's constantly chasing money, so he's saying here, not only after the great toll of anxiety do people eat their daily bread, they are constantly worried and depressed. They're attached to the other side. It's good to be successful, it's good to have money, but it shouldn't cost you your, your happiness. Because at the end of the day, you can't control it. You can, you can control it, you can get into the business, you make an effort, you shoot the arrow, where the arrow goes, it's not up to you. If the if a wind came, comes and takes the arrow tomorrow, you can't control that. But when you want to be in control where the arrow is going to hit, you can't do that. It's against nature. So again, money. Money is costing a person to constantly. So there's no way you can become spiritually connected to God if you're constantly chasing money. I don't care what kind of hat you wear. I don't care what kind of keeper you wear. Bottom line, if this is all your lust, yeah, he looks like a regular guy, but inside of him, he's running after money all day long. And Rav Nachman says, what happens? It shortens your life. It shortens your life. It shortens your life. That's why he says, now you know. What, what is a heart attack? <laughs> Too much stress. Why are you stressed? Are you in control of anything in this world? <laughs> you control, you, you make an effort. After that, can't do nothing about it. Sometimes the more I work for something, the more I ended up realizing I had absolutely no control. Of it. So you have to, without the moon and trust, without, without a person having faith, He's going to be very disappointed and he's going to be very miserable in life. He says, the deeper a person is sunk in for a desire for wealth, he's going to have less understanding of life and his days are going to be short. Right? He says, if, you, if a person, and one reason that you're going to guarantee that you're going to fall spiritually is running after money all day long. Running after money. Worrying about money, you can almost guarantee that this guy is not going to be, have any kind of spirituality. Guaranteed. Because that's desire. He's a slave. You should put slave number 2522. What are you talking about? I'm not a slave. Yes, you're a slave. Rabbi Nachman says you're a slave. So chasing money for an escape of your happiness, that means if you come home and your mood is determined if you make money or not, you have a problem. If you come home and your mood is determined, how you're happy, if you're able to do exercise, if you're able to go wake up in the morning, if you're able to go to synagogue, if a person has a spiritual endeavor, it's based on how much money he makes that day, that's going to be a problem long term. Because compounded, you're going to be, your brain's going to be fried, you're going to be stressed out, and we know already 80% of all illnesses are stress related. So out of shape, stressed about money, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? So that's the second thing that's putting you in slavery. So remember, happiness is not, you can't just forget it, it doesn't just come to you. You have to, just, you have to get out of slavery, you have to get out of slavery first. Then you can try to pursue happiness. But first you have to understand, okay, I, I'm a slave to something right now, let me work on that desire first, and let me try to eliminate my desires first, and then I could start. Sexual desire I speak a lot about, I see a lot of young guys, unfortunately, falling in there. You, there's no reason in the world for 17, 18 year olds, 21 year olds to be depressed. Yet you see it all day long. I see people in rehab, 20 years old, 18 years old, 17 years old, depressed. You haven't even lived yet. 
How come there's such a depression? How could somebody so young be so depressed? He doesn't even have a mother-in-law yet. How could he be so depressed? <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. How could he be so depressed? Does it make sense to you? So being in the addiction field, I was able to realize there's one pattern that Rabbi clearly says. This is more related for the guys. But when a person, unfortunately, if a person is constantly in desires for spilling seed, what happens? Instead of the seed becoming a human, what does it do? It's a half, it's a, half a human. So it goes, who created me? Oh, that guy created you. Let me give you his address. So all of a sudden, the person has all these extra obstacles in his life. You understand? That's caused by spilling seed. I speak about spilling the seed all the time, and I tell people, without getting out of this desire, that's why we did the 40-day challenge, without getting out of that desire, you're really tempted, you're not going to go anywhere, because your parnasa, your livelihood is determined by your Brit. That's the way God made it. That's the rules. The rules of engagement. So if a girl is looking for a guy, and the guy is not careful about this Brit, he's going to be able, God forbid, he can cheat on her. He's not going to be in a soul state. You can't because you're a slave. Remember, you can't be in a soul state if we're still desires. So we know, unfortunately, there's studies now showing, even there's a thing called the NoFap Challenge, that what happens is when a person has excessive production of spilling the seed, it's creating the same chemical as dopamine when a person has a craving for cocaine. So he, he becomes addicted to it. So unfortunately, this creates klipot. This creates negative things that attach to you. Now, if you're walking around life with 25 luggages every time you got to go here to here, life is going to become a little heavier for you. And you're going to be depressed. So Rabbi Nachman says very clearly, he says the Brit and depression, what happens, the first thing he's going to do is you're going, is you're going to be depressed. Why? Because you created something that was supposed to go into a human and now it became, it just it left. So the soul, the spiritual sense of that thing, comes in and attacks, attaches to the person. I remember 20 years ago, when I was throwing clubs in South Beach. This was a big problem I was dealing with, and I used to make $10,000 a night and lose $20,000 the next morning because of this. I tell people in addiction, especially you have to understand where the seed comes from your mind. <laughs> where do you think the seed comes from? It comes from your brain. So if you're throwing away your brain, what kind of decisions are you going to have? And it affects your, 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 your ability to think, it will give you brain fog, They'll give you all kinds of wonderful things that are going to prevent you. That's what you see. A lot of these kids, 20, 20, 21, 20 year olds, I have brain fog. What do you mean you have brain fog? How could you have brain fog? Because of this. What is brain fog? Klipot. Klipot are the negative husks that surround the person. So these are the things, unfortunately, that if you don't connect to your soul, because your soul always wants lust. Your soul always wants, your, your ego always wants lust. One thing about the ego, it wants more, it wants more where the body doesn't. You understand? The soul says, how can I not go? How can I hold myself? It's your ego. But your soul doesn't want that. Your soul is drawn to love, not lust. So as long as a person is lusting, and he's spilling the seed, and he's causing all these things, Rabbi Nachman says, all the pain and suffering is coming from this. We have tons of classes on this, how it affects the way you think, it affects the way it affects your panasa, and it creates extra blockages on you. It makes you become very depressed. So spilling of the seed and depression, I can almost guarantee it to you. So it's wonderful to be happy, but we can't, you can't go into the game being down 49 nothing every day. You can't be down 49 nothing and expect to be happy. You, you got to at least give yourself a chance to win. So these desires, unfortunately, make you start the day, wow, I'm down 49 nothing. How am I going to come back? So you feel hopeless, because you're not getting the right serotonin. So now, forget the religion, forget your soul. I'm showing you scientifically that these are the factors that a person is in slavery. So again, this is a choice. A person can say, you know what? Let me work on the food. Let me work on my desires. God forbid, if I'm spilling the seed, I have to stop it. We, have, we already gave a solution, tikkun aklali. But the biggest problem is when, 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 a, when, when a seed is supposed to be a human being, because it's so valuable, if it doesn't become a human being, it becomes a negative klipa, God forbid, a demon, and it goes on to the person who created him. And that creates a lot of barriers. So that's why you see a lot of kids, young guys, with all kinds of problems, and, and they, can't, they, can't, they don't have any willpower. They don't have any self-confidence. This is why. There's no reason why 21-year-old kids, 28 and 28 kids, should walk around so depressed like this. 
but this is not mentioned, but Rav Nachman mentioned it. So again, these are the three things that happen. These are the three things. So the main point of this class is we want to first eliminate. Eliminate which one are we a slave to? We have to ask yourself, what am I a slave to? The more you eliminate that, the more better you're going to feel, the more you're going to want to go more into your soul state. Because these things, unfortunately, it blocks your heart. That's why you see it's very hard. A lot of people are not really connected to Judaism. Why is he not connected to Judaism? You know, when you were a kid, the whole Torah was taught to you? A person had to, he, had to, he knows the whole Torah by heart. But how come, how come you can't tap into it? It's because the layers on the soul. So this is a serious class. This is not a joke. You can't expect, that's why I tell people, how's your eating? How's your, are you running after money all the time? I can't help you unless you, you, you have to help yourself. You have to want it. But at least the beginning of success is learning. So now I just gave you the three things, because if you don't have your heart into any spirituality, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. So as long as we worry, we get depressed, we chase our desires all the time, this is reality. All right? So that's today's class. Thank you.